smart. Thank you. I didn't realize it's going to be in the movies when I come over here. <laughs> Uh, it's May 17th, 1997. It's a quarter till 10 in the morning, and we're at the 12th Armored Division picnic in Emporia, Kansas. Uh, my name is Rachel McDonald, and I'm with the ACU History Department. Can you please state your name? I'm John Gregg, John C. Gregg, okay. from Lyons, Kansas. Uh, can you tell me your battalion and company? Oh, sure. It was the C Company of the 119th Armored Engineer Battalion. 12th Armored Division. Um, why don't you start with uh, describing your parents and, and your growing up where you lived? Well, I was born and raised on a farm just about two miles north of a little town called Nickerson, Kansas. It's <clears throat> right, really right about in the center of Kansas, about in the heart of Kansas. As a matter of fact, it's about 125 miles west of the Emporia here where we are today. But I grew up on a farm, and we was about two miles out of town, and at the, in those days, we went to school in town, and, and we walked back and forth to school all the time. I had uh, a brother and three sisters, and all through grade school, we walked back and forth to school, bad weather and good weather. But it got in high school then, and a little bit later, white cars was coming in style, and so we did have a car that, then that we drove back and forth to high school. I graduated from high school at Nickerson, Kansas. In 1939, I went to Hutchison to junior college in 1939 and 1940. And I got a, graduated from Hutchison Junior College, got a two-year teaching certificate where I was qualified or permitted to teach school. Taught school one term at Haven, Kansas, and after that was in the year of 1941 and 42, spring of 42, Pearl Harbor occurred that winter. And uh, in spring after school was out, why, uh, of course, I was classified. Uh, we, I was married. We got my wife and I got married after I graduated from high school or from college. But uh, I was classified at uh, 1A and and uh, went into service then in the fall of, of 42. That would be, yeah, December 7th of 41 was Pearl Harbor. Then the following December, I went into the service. I took my basic training at uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas with this 14th Armored Division. And uh, after basic, why the ASTP program was being organized and uh, I was selected for the ASTP program and went to Texas A&M College with, uh, in the ASTP program. It was down there from the inception of the program until it was abandoned. After the program was abandoned, I went from Texas A&M then over to, San, or to Camp Barkley and joined the 12th Armored Division at Camp Barkley. And from there on, I went overseas with them. Um, how did you feel when that when that program was uh, dissolved? Well, I was really disappointed. <clears throat> it was uh, it was set up to uh, um, give a, a full uh, uh, education there. So that, matter of fact, when when you come out of there, if your program is completed, you were supposed to be uh, on the same basis as a as an officer's candidate school and. Uh, be taken in then as, uh, as an officer in, in the service. But, um, that part didn't bother me so much as the fact that I was losing the possibility of the education which was being provided, which I really did appreciate. And I would never have had the opportunity to have gone to Texas A&M or uh, college like that had not that occurred. Well, what, what did you study in school when you were in the junior college at A&M? Well, in, in junior college, of course, I just took basic education, which was qualified you to teach school. And uh, then when I went to Texas a and I was in civil engineering uh, to, to be a civil engineer, which was surveying and this kind of stuff, construction. Um, describe a little bit uh, 
when you first arrived um, in, in the Army and, and your basic training experience? Well, <clears throat> like I said, I took my basic training in, in, in uh, Fort, uh, Kent, down at Fort Smith, Arkansas. Uh, I know the name of it, but no. Camp Chaffee. Okay, Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. And uh, they put me in field artillery. So my basic training was all in field artillery. And uh, I was quite surprised that when I went from Texas A&M, then after the program abandoned, they put me in the, in the engineers over at, uh, in the 12th Army Division, which was, turned out to be fine because I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed being in the engineer. And uh, would probably have been better off if I'd been an engineer to start with because I just never did care too much about field artillery. But uh, I did take my basic in field artillery training. Um, describe uh, camp life a little bit for me. Well, down there in Arkansas, it, of course it was in the spring. I went into service in December the 9th and the time we got around, got classified, and they got basic training started, I suppose it was January the 10th or something like that. And in the dead of winter, and we like to froze to death down there in Arkansas. I, and that, <clears throat> that, there's only one place colder in the world, as far as I'm concerned, than Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, and that's Abilene, Texas. The, the humidity and stuff down there was so high, and in, in the winter, and it got so cold when it was damp like that. But, uh, of course, basic there was 20 mile hikes and all like this. And hiking and, and that type of military life never did particularly bother me like it did a lot of people. Uh, I, a kid uh, walking back and forth to school and running around out in the country all the time, uh, used to that kind of experience, didn't, it didn't bother me. Like, but walking for a lot of people was, was a big problem where you go on those hikes and, and it was 20 mile hikes and you, some of them come straggling in hours later than, than the time they completed their hike. And I did get that. I took, got pneumonia, took cold down there. I can't tell you. I spent a week in the hospital while I was there in basic. So. But that was not unusual. I mean, there was a lot of people who had cold. You were exposed to a lot of weather that you wasn't normally used to. Uh, tell me some um, about some of your friends at this time that you worked with. <clears throat> well, while we was in basic training, right at the end of my basic, uh, of I had, like I said, we'd gotten married a year earlier, and uh, we had a daughter born in October, just before I went into service in December. So she was just a baby, and. After basic was over, I, uh, I made arrangements for her to come down to Fort Smith and visit with me. And uh, she spent three or four weekends down there before they sent me on the ASTP training. But there was a couple that shared an apartment with us that we got quite well acquainted with. And they were from up in Pennsylvania somewhere. Their name was Eisenman, E-I-S-A-M-A-N. E Really, they was about the only two couple, the only couple that, uh, as husband and wife that we got very well acquainted with. Um, the, other, the other guys were just everybody in the barracks and, and all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, describe uh, the sergeants and the officers that you called during, during this time of training. <clears throat> well, in basic, uh, we had most of our basic uh, training officers, I think, were what they called old line officers, that officer, men that were in the military prior to World War II. They had most of them been somewhere, see this was getting along there in, uh, in the spring of 43, and uh, most of those guys had been overseas in the military in Africa, and, and in the early stages of the war, because they had been in the military prior to the war, see. So they was drawn right into that thing when it first started. And having been overseas and then came back as cadrymen, or in, 
in, in, in our situation there, like, uh, I mean, they were pretty, they were pretty much military people. I mean, they, they demanded the utmost and uh, had every right to, I guess. Uh, we thought probably that we had been abused on many occasions, and, <clears throat> but uh, that was normal. Uh, everybody, uh, you wasn't a good soldier unless you had something to bitch about, you know. You have to keep griping and bitching about everything. But uh, I had no serious complaints or uh, quarrels with anybody over the service that we got and the training that we got. Um, what do you recall about Camp Campbell? <clears throat> well, ma'am, I never did get to Camp Campbell. See, uh, the 12th Armored started at Camp Campbell. Uh, as I understand it, but I didn't join the 12th until after the ASTP program, and I joined them at Camp Barkley. So uh, that prior to that, I didn't have much memories of it. Um, well, tell me about Camp Barkley. <clears throat> well, Camp Barkley, of course, we left Texas A&M not knowing where we was headed. Um, like everything else, they, get you together and tell you you're going to go somewhere and, and you ha have hopes that it's it's for the best and I was quite surprised when I ended up at Camp Barkley. Uh, I didn't know anything about Abilene, Texas or Camp Barkley prior to that. I'd never been down here. But uh, we get over there and, and it's it's a different, uh, definitely a lot different than Arkansas was. And, Just a lot of a lot of mesquite and sand and rattlesnakes is about the <laughs> most I know about it. Uh, what kind of recreation did you have? Well, <clears throat> just Army post recreation as far as that's concerned. Uh, we had they had all kinds of things there on post, uh, softball and baseball and, and uh, We actually got to, I didn't spend all that much time at Camp Barkley. Uh, it was probably the first of July when we got over there. And uh, then we left Camp Barkley that fall, you know, around the first of September, somewhere like that, to go overseas. So I didn't have all that much time at Camp Barkley. And in that time, I did manage to get a furlough home for two weeks. And, and that would have been helped too. My experiences at Camp Barkley mainly was just in engineering training, building bridges and this kind of stuff, doing things that the engineer do, and which the guys that was already in my outfit had already, it was old half to them, but it was all new stuff to me, and a lot of it I kind of enjoyed. Uh. What do you know about General Perrier and his relief uh, from his position? About what? General Perrier. Do you know anything about General Perrier? Well, <clears throat> not not all that much. General Brewer was there when when we came, I think, and, and uh, I never did uh, have anything to do with them. I was a, a, an enlisted man. I was not a non-com or an officer at that time and you know, I just they were people that I had no, no contact with so I didn't know too much about my as far as, as command why well, I was perfectly well satisfied with command I think we had good commanding officers especially our downline officers our company officers and everybody was, was real good people What do you remember about um, the maneuvers you did in Texas? Well, <clears throat> of course, there's one outstanding uh, thing that, uh, about our Texas maneuvers that uh, was uh, a disaster, but it was it was quite uh, memorable. <clears throat> they have a area out there west of in the western part of the camp where they two hills on each side. It's just a natural 
amphitheater-like place, and down in the valleys is where you, the troops could all be up on the hills on each side, and, down, and anything that was being displayed could be displayed down in the valley. And we was having what they called a snake demonstration, and it was how to clear a minefield. Now, a snake is a, is a long, uh, I'm going to say about a city block long, two pieces of steel that are bolted together and it's fastened this long thing made out of steel, out of segments of steel. And it's bolted together and on the front end of it it's got a round ball so that you can take a tank and hook it to the back end of it and push that thing through a minefield and then you can explode that thing. It's filled with, with TNT and dynamite and when you explode it then that would set off all the mines within so many feet of each side of that thing. In other words, it would clear a pathway through a minefield that you could drive a tank and trucks and vehicles through. And this was a demonstration that day of how to use this tank, this snake, to clear that minefield. Well, prior to the demonstration, they had to lay a minefield down, down in this valley and get it all set up for the demonstration. And that particular day of the demonstration, there was troops out there, practically everybody out of Camp Barkley and a lot of people from Fort Hood were down there. Thousands of people up on, on the hillside watching this demonstration. And about the tank, time they got the, ready to pull the demonstration off, there were three men that were left down there to make the final preparations, in other words, arm the, the mines, pull the trip wires and stuff, get them all ready. And somebody goofed, somebody made a little accident, and the whole thing went up in smoke. <clears throat> well, of course, the three men that were killed were the three men that were still down there in, in the minefield. So the demonstration never did get yeah, they get pulled off in its entirety. Uh, it was a disaster as far as the demonstration is concerned, and we lost three men out of our company in that in that that day in that demonstration. Um, tell me about the trip to Camp Shanks. <clears throat> well, we left Camp Barkley, and uh, of course got on a train and and it was supposedly nobody knew where he was going or anything. But as we got coming through up to the country, I began to notice some names of towns that as we go through that were familiar. And as we came north, I knew that we were coming on the tracks that were going to go through Augusta, Kansas, which is just over east of Wichita. It's also my wife's hometown, and her grandmother lived just about a block from the tracks. And so when we went by there, I was at the window, looked out, and the last thing I seen in Kansas was I seen Grandma's house over there. So we went within a block of her house, because I didn't, couldn't tell anybody, couldn't nobody where I was at. But from there on, then we went up across the eastern part of the country and go, uh, we can see out during the daytime and everything. We went up to, over into Kansas. Niagara Falls, I guess, crossed over into Canada and back down to Camp Shanks. And, and it was just another train ride from then on. And Were you allowed any passes into New York City? <clears throat> yes, yes. I went to New York City uh, just once, one, one day. And uh, of course, I was lost in time. I had never been there before, never been there since. But. Uh, and I think it was five or six of us all together. And uh, I think one one guy out of our outfit had been there before. Of course, we relied on him to know something about it, but he didn't know any more than we did. So it was kind of, but we had a good time. Found our way back to where we were supposed to be when we to go home anyway, get back to camp. I guess if we hadn't found our way back, they'd have found us and took us back sooner or later. <laughs> Um, what was the trip across to Europe like? <clears throat> well, we went on the ship, the Tasker H. Bliss, and uh, I 
I can't say that I didn't get seasick, but I, a few days out, uh, I did get nauseous a little bit, but I was not near like a lot of them. A lot of them were hanging over the rail, really. But it was, uh, I think we was 13 or 14 days going across, and it was real, we had a lot of real rough water, we had a lot of uh, smooth water, but uh, it was, the ship was a pretty good sized ship, and, and uh, we went over and we docked at Liverpool, England, I can remember that. We got off the ship at Liverpool and we, they had this great big kind of like parking areas and had us all in formations, you know, our groups would all be in formations. We had our duffel bags, we sat on our duffel bags and uh, just killed time standing out there, no place to go, no place, nothing to do but just stay in your, in your formation. And man, we were there for hours and hours and hours it seemed like before they finally got us transportation out there, then we had real good transportation. We had uh, semi-trucks that, was, that were uh, like to haul gravel and stuff in that just had sideboards upside. So we got in there with all our duffel bags and we just packed in there standing up like, <laughs> like so. In, in the dark then, that, that was almost dark, and by the time they hauled us in, so we didn't have any idea where we were going. They finally got us somewhere and dumped us out. But that was quite a trip. It was, it was something different. What was the Tidsworth Barrack like there in England? <clears throat> the what? The Tidsworth Barrack. Oh, the Tidsworth Barrack. Well, Tidsworth Barracks to me was a tent campground. We, were, we stayed in tents there at, the, at Tidsworth. And uh, <clears throat> after we'd been there about, you know, I'm going to say, a week or so, and then we finally got moved in, part of our guys early, and I did, got moved into what was Tidworth Barracks itself, the old old uh, English army uh, barracks type there, and they were, there was no heat, it was cold, it was foggy, it was dreary, and the whole, whole time, uh, of course, everything that we did we had no nothing to do except to march and and hike and this kind of stuff. They did. We did get a pass to London and uh, while we was there, but from the time we got up in the morning and, and ate and got dressed and got and come time to go to work or do something, while it was get out in formation and do close order drill and this kind of stuff. Of course, they had to do that. They had to keep us exercising. They had to keep us doing something like that to keep us from fighting amongst ourselves, I guess. What do you recall about your first combat experience? <clears throat> well, we uh, crossed the channel and went over into Cherbourg. Uh, the, the invasion had already taken place, and our first uh, assignment really was on the Cherbourg Peninsula and uh, they was figuring that the Germans would try to come, come back in uh, from on the Cherbourg Peninsula close to the Shetland Islands in there. So they had us stationed down there patrolling about 20 miles of that beach area and uh, we was there for I guess maybe a week or so before they finally moved us on the inland. <coughs> uh, from there we went on up into the to the Leon area, and uh, this was getting they, by that time they were getting pretty close to this Maginot Line and the Siegfried Line through there. And our first real uh, combat experience was is, it was when they penetrated that Siegfried and uh, that line and, and taking the combats. And most of our action there was with flames lowers, <coughs> the flamethrowers. And we had the uh, engineers had a lot of them, and we had the demolitions that uh, we was using to break the pillboxes and, and one thing or another to get through that imaginal line. Uh, the flamethrower, I think, was one of the most fantastic instruments that we had to, to use in the service at, at that particular time. It was something new, but. You could go up to one of the pillboxes. That I mean, it was it was 
absolutely impenetrable, but once you shot that napalm and that fire into those portholes and doorways and one thing and the other, they was they, they, they was no place. Them people had to come out of that thing. They just they had they had no choice. And if they stayed in there, they would just cook. That was all it was to it. So it was it was a real fantastic weapon and. I think it was one of the big reasons that we could cross through that line as quick as we did, was the fact that we had that, that weapon. What was the relationship between the, the members of the 12th Armored Division and the, the French citizens that you encountered? And the French what? The French citizens that you oh, encountered. Oh, the people? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, for the most part, until we crossed over the, over the Rhine River, well, I think the people seem to always be out there to welcome the GIs as they come to. Um, especially in the early part of France as we've gone through. Of course, we had, wasn't in combat at that time. We was coming on, coming up behind, so to speak. But they was real helpful and wanted to do everything that they could for us in that respect. And, and I think might be a lot of times we uh, uh, imposed on the citizens more than they did on us in, in a lot of respects because uh, we were pretty demanding in a lot of ways it's at that time I think thinking back on it but once we got into Germany itself <clears throat> then there was uh, a lot of a lot of those people, they couldn't, it was, it was awful hard for them to accept the fact that defeat was inevitable and that they was going to, uh, it, it was, they was going to, they just wasn't going their way. And, and the further you went, the more uh, it got to be that way, it seemed to me like. Of course, at the last, when they seemed there was no, no hopes, they just had to give up and, and quit. What was uh, the Battle of Hurlesheim like? <clears throat> well, I think everybody involved at Hurlesheim had different parts to play. In other words, he had a different job to do. And it just so happened that uh, when we come to the Hurlesheim area, the tankers were taking the terrible beating and the infantry was taking beating from the direct fire from the, from the Germans. And we engineers at that particular time didn't have any bridges to build or missions to do, so we became infantry, went along with the infantry, they assigned us infantry work. And uh, we were outside of Hurlesheim about, oh, I guess half, three quarters of a mile looking in. Well, a lot of the fighting was going on amongst the troops and we were dug in back out of it on the perimeter and doing infantry work. Later on we did do bridge construction, help build bridges across the Rhine and this kind of stuff. What was it like to uh, experience the, the casualties of uh, the battles? <clears throat> well, it was real hard to uh, see all the things that was happening and realize actually up until Hurlesheim everything had been going our way let's put it this way everything was all the problems was on the other they, they were taking the blunt of it but once we got to Hurlesheim it, it, the table was turned and, and we could see that there was another side to this war that we We hadn't experienced up until then. <clears throat> Fortunately, it after after Hurlesheim was over, this whole thing lasted three or four days, and after that, it was the other way again. It was back in our favor, so and things was going our way again. But <clears throat> there were other places, of course, that up in the. Uh, Forests up north and the boats and places like that, <clears throat> which had uh, a lot of different 
com type of combat and stuff that were than what we had. <clears throat> Actually in Hurlshine itself, and I wasn't in Hurlshine itself that when the capture and all, like I said, I was back out with the engineers and we were sitting and dug in and infantry out there. But <clears throat> it was it was bad to see the losses that we had to suffer, that's for sure. What was your experience with the German POWs? <clears throat> well, uh, after the war was over, and they were these POW places we had, we was in uh, Heidenheim, I think it was the name of the town, and they had a big POW camp there. <clears throat> and. Uh, I don't know why, but I guess because I was a school teacher beforehand. Uh, and for some reason or other, they had me, uh, there were three or four of us, I think, that uh, they picked out. To, there was a lot of the Germans wanted to learn to speak English. And I guess they had transmitted this information to somebody, and somebody took a hold of it. And so they decided they would have a school to teach the Germans to speak English to anybody that wanted to. And uh, they started that program and, and uh, shall I say, roped me into helping with that. <laughs> and I wasn't too enthusiastic over it, I, I quite frankly admit. But uh, uh, during the course of our time over there, I had uh, picked up a few English uh, German words and stuff like this. And, couldn't speak German, German fluently by any means, but enough that I could match up some words and one thing or another. And I began to see the relationship between the German language and a lot of our English language. Like, uh, for example, kinder, K-I-N-D-E-R. <clears throat> uh, we have kindergartens in, uh, China. Well, in Germany, uh, they have kinder. Kinder means child or uh, a little child, see? And so there's a lot of the words that have had relationships that are related once you really stop and got to thinking about it. And um, when I began seeing that relationship then and trying to match up the words and one thing another way, <clears throat> we spent, I think, about a month after the war was over that I was really involved with trying to teach these guys. And they lost interest, uh, a lot of those guys were getting the opportunity to go back to their homes and, and it was kind of falling apart and, and then that was abandoned. But um, I had a good relationship with them and, and we didn't have any particular problems with the POWs that uh, causing uh, problems. And I'm sure that they would like to have stomped us all in the ground if they could have got away with it, but they didn't. Um, tell me about uh, your first involvement with uh, the death camps and uh, if you were involved in any of the liberation of the death camps. <clears throat> well, I, I was at several of them, but my presence at them was not in actual liberation of them. We, we was in convoy, and, and as the convoys would, these, would go through these these camps. A lot of time, the time our engineer group got up there, they had already been a lot of people already into the camp areas. And of course, those people were everywhere. And uh, it, it was just unbelievable. Uh, so we kind of come up, if you can imagine, you, you, you got two or three miles of army vehicles that's moving into a, a camp area like that and finding it. And then by the time we guys from back here get on up there, there's already been a lot of people in there and one thing or another, and you, they, words come back as to what they found and, and all. And <clears throat> Actually, the first feeling was just get the hell out of there as quick as you could. And, and 
because it was so bad you just didn't want to spend any time there if you didn't have to. <clears throat> Leave it to, to the people behind it to come and take care of it that, that was coming along that, that was their business to do that. Because actually we didn't have anything, any way to help them when, when you got there. I mean, what you got, you got a rifle in your hand and a mess kit and a few things like that and uh, little bits of uh, things you might have stashed away in your kit, a piece of chocolate or something, is all you had to give them and to help them with. So, uh, but it was, it was terrible. Were you uh, aware of the situation with the death camps while, when you were, you know, still fighting her I mean, the back and, and, uh, and training? <coughs> but when did y'all first become aware? Not until after, no, we didn't really see any of those camps until after we crossed the, after Hurlesheim, until after we'd crossed over into Germany itself. Uh, I was not aware that there was any of them in France. That, you know, I didn't see any of them or know of anything like that. But once we got across, <coughs> after across the, the Rhine and got over into Germany, well, we could we started running across it. What do you call about the, the German uh, citizens that you encountered and uh, and you, their treatment of, of your unit of the division? <clears throat> well, if they they treated you all right, I mean they had. They, it was a matter of knowing which side your bread was buttered on, you see what I'm saying? They knew that, that, that if they wanted anything, or their best interest was to treat us with kid gloves and do everything and cater to us and count out to us in every way, shape, and form. But I'm sure there was, just, there was a lot of, of uh, other feelings hatred and one thing or another there. And, uh, matter of fact, uh, years later, um, we was up at Canopolis Lake here, and my family and I, and uh, there was a young man and his wife there from Germany, and he was over in this country. He was studying to be a doctor or something up in Chicago. <coughs> and. Uh, just happened we got the visit in there at the lake and they was camp near us and uh, he found out that I'd been over there in the service in one day and, uh, <clears throat> and he had even though he this was he was a generation away from that he might have been a baby at that time but, but he had he was just filled with hatred of, of, of the American people and servicemen of, of that thing and he was still very much in, instilled with the with the Nazi Nazism and, and, and the, you know, that German bringing up and I, I I think those people there may still be a lot of it there it, to me it wouldn't be something they could they could turn the switch around and change overnight as quick as they would like us to believe in a lot of that. Uh, what were your uh, duties during the occupation there? <clears throat> well, during occupation, other than patrol areas, and, and like I said, myself, I worked with this, in this uh, camp, we had a, matter of fact, they had a, a, about 20 guys that had volunteered for this English program, and they would, we'd take them from, go to the camp area, and they'd be waiting as, as a group then we would go to a building there where we had a meeting room that we could visit and talk to him, uh, talk to him, and try to communicate and learn to speak across. But <clears throat> other than that, uh, I had we had very little actual duties assigned to us other than just to kill the time, and, and we did go places a lot of a lot of places and walk most everywhere we went to walk. And it was nothing to take off and walk from another one town to the next to get as long as you back for, for your bed check at night, you could go back where you could walk in the daytime. So we did do a lot of that. 
Do you have any other stories or anything you'd like to talk about? <coughs> I don't know. I, I guess uh, one of the one thing that my uh, my dad there we when we started home from Germany, we went to Orange, France. We went down to Port of Orange, and uh, I think we got on a train in Strasbourg or somewhere like that, and it was boxcar, a train of boxcars, and of course it was as many guys as you could get in a boxcar without somebody accidentally falling out. But everywhere that train went, of course, and it was it was like a slow train to Georgia or something you might hear about. But every time that train would get into a little town or something, and the minute the train stopped, it was just like bees in a beehive. I mean, people coming out of both doors on both sides, see. And the minute the train started to move, it, it was all coming back in. It was just out and in. And, of course, guys pick up everything that they could get their hands on. And we went to this one little town, and they had a wicker basket. And they, a lot of these wicker baskets over there, about that big, stand up about that high with the neck on, and it's jugging. So the guys, if anything had, a, if a jug had anything in it to drink, it had to be drank. And this particular day at that particular time, two old boys come back to our boxcar carrying this wicker basket with this about a five gallon jug in it, see. Didn't know what was in it. <clears throat> they heaved it up into the car, and of course they was having to pull them and everything else. The train was starting to pick up speed. Got that thing in there. Well, it was a matter of uncorking it and then getting in line and, and you didn't, by the time one guy got off of that jug, well, that somebody else was waiting there to get a drink. And it was one guy after the other that was just gagging and choking and carrying on. And, but you figured they were drinking cognac or something or, or vodka. And but after a while, you finally began to smell it. It was perfume. See? And if the, the smell began to penetrate around the guys farther in line, begin to realize it wasn't vodka and these guys were all trying to spit it out and get rid of it. One big swallow of it was enough. <laughs> but it, it was, that was really something. I can remember that. It was quite an experience. <laughs> and uh, then, did you you joined the ASTP from Arkansas? Yeah. So that's how you ended up in Texas. And mm -hmm. Okay. Well, <clears throat> matter of fact, at uh, after basic training, <clears throat> they, I think everybody that was in basic training, they were starting this AST program, P program, and several others. I think at the time other programs. But I think everybody in camp took a battery of tests. Because it seemed to me like we, we went for tests morning and night for several days of all these kind of tests. And some of them were simple, little simple kindergarten tests and drawing pictures and got on. This stuff didn't make sense. And we had no idea why they were doing all this at that time. But later on, and then, before too long, we found out that they were starting some of these programs. And, and matter of fact, I was singled out uh, as one of those. There was a bunch of guys that went. We went to, first went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Louisiana State University. And this was to go down there to be uh, assigned and wait, a wait assignment to these various programs. And they was trying to, the ASTP program was set up at schools all over, like Arizona School of Mines and Rutgers University and every college around the country had this ASTP program set up. But it was in the beginning stages and so we waited at Baton Rouge at the university there. Uh, we stayed in the dormitories in the stadium 
that football stadium has is, is dormitories. And we stayed there for oh, well over a month until they finally assigned us to a different school. And uh, they assigned me to Texas A&M. Why Texas A&M and not Colorado School of Mines or somewhere else, I don't know. But that was way, just the way it fell. <clears throat> I was quite pleased when I found out that that's where I was going. And so they assigned you to the civil engineers? Or yeah. Or did you get to choose that? No. They assigned you. That was, <clears throat> after I came home from the service, of course, I still had my teacher's qualifications and could have went back to school teaching. But by that time, I was well aware of the fact that I did not have patience enough to teach school. I didn't have patience with myself for a lot of things, and I was quite short-tempered. And uh, for, I went to hometown and I went to work in a furniture store uh, with a fellow who was an undertaker. He was a friend of the family, but he was also a friendly undertaker, so to speak. <clears throat> and he uh, was real interested in getting somebody to learn the undertaking business to become a bomber. And so he told me he would help me go to embalmer school here in Missouri if I would care to go. And I was seriously thinking about it and uh, was working for him until I made up my mind. And one day uh, the depot agent from the Missouri Federal Railroad came in the furniture store to collect a freight bill. And he, of course, I'd known him all my life. And he said, well, what are you going to do to yourself now that you're home? And I said, well, I'm going to go to embalmer school, I guess. And so he realized that I was serious about it. And he said, well, if you're going to go to school, why don't you go to telegraph school and learn to work for the railroad? And I said, no, that'd be, it. I, I, I wasn't capable of that. <clears throat> well, he, th he thought I would be, but he said, it would take some effort. You know, I'd have to put out some effort to try. Well, between him and that uh, undertaker, they got the, going after me from both sides, one punch me in, one in the other, pulling me both directions. But I ended up going to, to Chillicothe, Missouri, the telegraph school, and went to work for the Missouri Federal Railroad finally. Spent 37 years as a depot agent for the Missouri Federal Railroad throughout Kansas, and retired in 1982. And I really was glad that I made the choice that I did, because we had a real good it turned out to be a real good life for us. So two extremes. Uh, thank you for this interview. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate it.